Okay, well, it's nice to be here, and uh, this is certainly a nicer building. When I was an undergraduate, the math department was in some rickety old house that probably is long gone. And uh, we had uh, classes in some World War II building. Uh, MIT finally got rid of its last World War II building last year, so if it weren't raining, I was going to walk around today and see whether that building was still on campus here. But uh, decided not to do it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about econometrics today, <coughs> and I'm going to talk about uh, something that uh, I thought would be of interest to people, about estimation with many and weak instruments. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a particular model. And uh, this, this model first came up in econometrics, uh, oh, probably in the uh, 1940s and 50s, and has since taken over. So uh, regression uh, has been known since Gauss, uh, which I think it's the 17th century. Uh, and in these squares, and if you've taken a course in statistics, of course, uh, you've run across that. But economics has uh, a unique contribution to the subject, and that's the idea of equilibrium. So in a regression, what you're basically doing is uh, estimating a conditional expectation, saying conditional on some variables, uh, what's the expectation of, let's say, the left-hand side variable, which here I call y1. But the notion of equilibrium in economics uh, is that you have uh, quantities which are uh, variables which are simultaneously determined uh, in equilibrium. So the easiest one to think about is uh, price and quantity. <laughs> so to use an example, if you uh, you know follow commodities at all, since we're in the Duncan Millen Hall, if I remember right, that's cargo money. So I thought that would be a good thing to talk about today. Um, you know that the price of uh, food has gone way up. Uh, and so the price of corn and the price of wheat and, and all has gone way up. So why don't we use corn as an example? If we were to use corn as an example, Y1, the left-hand side variable, would be the price of corn. Y2, though, is the amount of corn that is demanded. And those variables are simultaneously determined uh, as the intersection of the supply and demand curve. Z1 are extra variables. It might be something like the introduction of the governor, government ethanol program, yet another thing the government has done to make poor people worse off. Um, but uh, that's going to shift the demand curve for ethanol because, of course, we're using a lot of corn for gasoline now. But anyway, the idea is, is that if you fit a regular least squares regression of Y1 on these right-hand side variables, you get biased and inconsistent estimates. Uh, and the reason for that is that the supply and demand, the price and the quantity, are simultaneously determined. So there was a, a uh, Norwegian named Havilah who was sitting in the Harvard Library during World War II to just, uh, you know, get out of Norway. And he, he figured this out, and this was first published in the 40s and has since followed. So the way that we get around this problem is to append another equation. We have y2, and we have these other variables, z1 and z2, which are called uh, predetermined or exogenous variables. And you can fit the combination of the two equations. And in a sense, this is the uh, backbone of uh, simultaneous equations in econometrics. Well, I want to <coughs> keep things as simple as possible, so uh, I'm going to use the uh, orthogonal projection, z1 prime, z, uh, z1 prime, z1 inverse, z1 prime. And uh, that's just that there. Then I'm going to subtract that off using the complementary projection of Q of Z1. That gets rid of the Z1s. It's called partialing out uh, in econometrics, or it's a fish law theorem. And so then I'm going to get things down to Y1 equal beta Y2 plus epsilon. So in other words, I've gotten rid of these variables that really don't create any problem. It's the Y2 that creates the problem. And then similarly, I've gotten rid of the Z1's here, and then I have Y2 equal, it's a little Z now, Y2 plus Z2. And so this is sort of the canonical form of what we're going to talk about. It, it's a problem in its simplest form, but also uh, gets all, all the complications, almost all the complications. Okay, the stochastic assumptions, epsilon and V are joint normal. We can generalize all this. We don't need normality, uh, but just to keep things simple for today, uh, I'm going to assume that. The key there are two key assumptions. The first is that those z's are not correlated with epsilon. So that's called the orthogonality assumption. See, up here, the whole problem is y2 is correlated with epsilon because of this equilibrium outcome, simultaneous outcome. In a typical regression, of course, you assume that the right-hand side variables are uncorrelated with epsilon. 
so the z is going to be assumed uncorrelated, but not y2. And then the second assumption is uh, pi 2 is not equal to 0. So that means that we can explain y2 with these so-called exogenous variables. <coughs> OK, uh, this is Microsoft against me. I can never really quite type right when I do slides. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, that says normalization. So without loss of generality, we set the sigma epsilon epsilon, right? sigma VV equal to 1. Oh, sorry. Uh, the variance of Y2, that is 1 minus R squared, where R squared is the R squared of this so-called reduced form equation. So R squared is just the amount of variance explained by this equation divided by the variance of Y2. And then the covariance term up here after these normalizations just becomes a correlation coefficient. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is in the 1950s, and the econometrics really got going, computers came in, and for 40 years, I would say 98% of every paper that you saw in a journal used the following estimator. It's called two stage least squares for historic reasons. But it's that we're going to estimate that coefficient of y2 by projecting it y2 on the subspace spanned by disease. <clears throat> this is the estimate. And first order asymptotic theory, which follows from a central limit theorem, says that we have root n convergence. So in other words, the square root of n times beta half minus the true beta converges in distribution to a normal 0 sigma squared. And this is the variance. Okay, so everybody did this. This worked fine. Uh, you know, there were all sorts of Monte Carlo experiments done to make sure this worked pretty well, uh, etc. <clears throat> and the topic of my talk today is going to be it turns out that in two cases, either you have many instruments or you have weak instruments, the first order approximation doesn't work very well, and we've now moved on to higher order approximations and uh, done different things. I should say that I'm only going to talk about estimation today. There's another associated problem of inference of what happens when you have many and weak instruments in inference. In the many instrument case, there's a paper on my website that I wrote last summer. It's just uh, MIT.edu, of course. And the weak instrument case has probably been best treated by a professor here uh, in the economics department. Uh, and I'm sure you can get stuff off uh, his website uh, as well, Frank Rabot. Okay, so here's where the problem arises in estimation. What we're going to do is we're going to substitute in. So remember, we have y1 equal beta y2 plus epsilon, but we can't run regression on this, so we substitute in z pi plus b. <coughs> and you estimate pi hat in that second equation. That's why this is called two stage v squared. And when you do that, uh, you get beta v plus epsilon. But of course, you don't know pi hat for sure, so you have this error term, pi minus pi hat. Now, in large samples, as n goes to infinity, which is the way that we typically do asymptotics in econometrics, this term, of course, goes to zero because you have a consistent estimate, and this goes away. But what happens if you have either many instruments or weak instruments? OK, well, these are the two equations. and. Uh, I probably won't read you through this. But the problem is, is that pi hat minus pi, as you can see, you estimate from this equation, pi hat minus pi is going to have v2 in it. Okay, that's the error term that arises from the second equation. And that v2 is the same as the v here. I just would have to write the 2. And so the error term is going to be correlated, and that's going to create a problem. So in other words, this pi hat is correlated with v because pi minus pi hat is, and that's going to introduce the bias. So that bias goes away asymptotically, and that's what first order asymptotic does. But let's see what happens when we do second order asymptotics. We do this, and see we have that pi hat minus pi term. Uh, again, I apologize for trying to put this into PowerPoint from uh, uh, Microsoft. But what you can see is if you get the bias term is equal to this times r squared times the variance of y uh, the uh, sum of the y2. Now, of course, this is going to go to infinity, but let's see what happens in finite samples. <laughs> well, second order, although it takes a little bit of math, you can show that the uh, expectation of this ratio is equal to the ratio of the expectation. That 
normally doesn't hold true, but it, it does here, uh, the third order term, the second order, the third order term of experience. So you do these evaluations, and what you do is you get the bias of two stage three squares is equal to k times that covariance term divided by r squared. Okay, so k is the number of instruments you have. And that's where many instruments comes in, because you can see that the bias depends on k. And in fact, you can do asymptotics by letting k go to infinity along with n, but you just let k divided by n go to a constant, and then the bias does not go away. So that's a many instrument problem. And then the weak instrument problem is that r squared is pretty close to zero. So if that pi is close to zero, r squared is close to zero. And then the denominator doesn't blow up. And in fact, um, you can let r squared remain constant, or essentially r squared here go to zero. And you can see that you have bias in the numerator, and then the denominator is not going to infinity fast enough. So from many instruments to weak instruments, you get bias in two stage three squares. OK, so the first thing, of course, you try to do is say, well, why don't I just get rid of that bias? And uh, there is a way to do that, and it's called the Navar estimator. Navar was an Indian mathematician. And so you, you basically figure out how to get rid of that second order bias term. And I derived that here. Uh, the organizers have the slides, and you can go through this if you're interested. But anyway, you get the bias corrected estimator. And so what you do is you take that two stage three squares estimator and you subtract off the bias. Okay, and so then you have an estimator of the second order, which is unbiased. However, here's the problem. The problem with this estimator, the Nagar estimator, the bias corrected estimator, I just write it out here. And what you can see is if you look at this denominator and you take some expectations from the denominator, this is not a proof, but this is just a sketch of it. This is actually the code one. If pi 2 is equal to 0 and you take the expectation of this denominator, it's equal to 0. So we have this estimator, and if pi 2 is exactly equal to 0, it blows up. It doesn't exist. Now, we've assumed that pi 2 is not equal to 0, but what happens if pi 2 is near 0? That's the weak instrument here. Well, if pi 2 is near 0, then with a certain probability, this denominator is going to be big enough that this estimator is not going to have moments. So this estimator turns out to have no moments whatsoever. It doesn't even have a first moment. So in a sense, it's a little bit akin to a Cauchy distribution. Well, <clears throat> that was known in the 1970s, but it was thought to be mainly a mathematical oddity. I mean, nobody really worried about going unbiased estimation anyway, the second order. But I mean, yeah, people worked on this, and they knew this didn't have moments. But I always told my students uh, that if this ever happened, uh, and you got to a situation where it blew up, you'd know it when you saw it, because we know that the, the price elasticity you know, can't be some incredibly odd number. That's where the economic dollars are. But it turned out I was wrong about this, and this problem with no moments uh, creates a problem. Well, the other estimator people said when the weak and many moments problem came up was do what's called limited information. Don't worry about that. Maximum likelihood. So to econometricians of a certain age, including me, maximum likelihood basically solved all, solved all problems. But the maximum likelihood estimator here, uh, if you take the expectation, this is a, a certain uh, characteristic or eigenvalue. If you solve for that, characteristic value and you take its expectation and plug in, it turns out the limo doesn't have any moments either. Maximum likelihood doesn't have any moments either. So we're in a situation that if you look at the distribution of the maximum likelihood estimator or the Nagar estimator, they're perfectly well defined at first order. So you use a, you know, use a Leopoldo central interfere and you get the distribution and they're root and consistent and everything is okay. okay. But it's one of these situations while asymptotically everything works in finite samples, they don't have any moments. So you get convergence asymptotically, but in finite samples, um, you can have problems. It turns out that in a paper that I published about five, six years ago with uh, uh, Jim Hahn, who used to teach at Brown, 
we actually show that the little estimator, in some sense, is a certain linear combination of what's called forward and reverse with our estimator. So there's a very close connection with the previous estimator we talked about, and neither of them have links. OK, so then along comes the guy who teaches in Iowa named Fuller. And for the mathematicians in the crowd, there's something called the Ilpo's inverse problem. I don't know whether any of you, if you're an applied mathematician, you might be familiar with the Ilpo's inverse. So when you try to invert an operator, and you get the characteristic values of the operator very near zero, uh, you start having problems, sort of like those denominators being zero. And that's called the Ilpo's inverse problem. And the way that mathematicians get around the Ilpo's inverse problem is to take a certain matrix and to add a diagonal term to it. Uh, and that's one, one of the ways around the Ilpo inverse problem. It's been known for years and years. And actually, this is what this guy Wayne Foley did, was he took the liberal estimator, remember we had that characteristic value theta, and he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract off alpha divided by n, which remember is the sample size, minus the number of instruments. And of course, this disappears asymptotically. But just this little change converts the limo estimator to an estimator that has moments. So you just completely solve the problem by changing this Ilpo's inverse problem and uh, making this change. And then the question is, how do you choose alpha? And alpha equal to 1, you get unbiased to second order. And alpha equal 4 is the minimum root mean square error estimated by second order. OK, so this is a, a very nice solution. Now, does all this matter? Or are we just playing, you know, we're just doing mathematical recreation? OK, so very famous paper in economics by a colleague of mine at MIT, Josh Angus. They look at the return to education from extra school. This is what problem that economists have been looking at for 30 years now. It's a very important problem. That is, we know that people who go to college get much higher wages than people who just have a high school degree. But of course, the amount of school you get is an um, endogenous variable, and uh, you need to take account of that with simultaneous equation methods. Okay, so uh, I, there are two versions of this when I teach my students. One is the Jewish Asian mother story, uh, and that is, is that in between violin lessons, you do better in school, uh, get more schooling, and then you do better on the job, so you get a higher salary. Um, so that's one way. Or the other way that uh, a Swedish friend of mine, I call it spunk, who he said is in Hans Christian Andersen. And people with more spunk get more education uh, and also get higher rates. Anyway, uh, Anderson Kruger had a very large sample of 329,500. And this is very large by, uh, this is government service by economic standards. And the return to education, if you do regularly squares, you get 0.71. These are the standard errors, but the sample size is large, of course. You get very small standard errors. So if we go and do the regular two-stage mixed squares estimator, we get 0.089. So this goes up from 0.071 to 0.089. So this means an extra year of schooling, you get 8.9% uh, extra uh, weighted. So this would be a result that has been in the econometric solution forever. But what happens is if you use 30 instruments, so 30 compared to 329,000 isn't particularly large, but if you do that and you run reverse two-stage least squares, so all you do is you reverse the left and right-hand side variable, estimated by two-stage least squares, and first-order asymptotics says you should get the same estimate. The first-order asymptotics works, apart from random variation, you should get pretty much the same estimate. Of course, after you invert the coefficient, and you really reverse it. But you'll see what happens is that the coefficient goes from 0.089 to estimate to 0.163. So that says even with the sample this large, the first order asymptotics isn't working because the sample size is approximately 2 to 1. And we know that this is downward biased, and we know this is upward biased, and that's exactly what happens. Now, if instead you only use three instruments rather than 30, then when you run forward and reverse these squares, you can see that first order asymptotics does a lot better, uh, although you still get uh, this degree of bias. And these stars are whether or not uh, you, re you reject the exogeneity under what's called a household specification test that I invented many years ago. And that's one of the reasons I'm interested in this problem, because, of course, I don't want people getting the wrong results when they do my specification test. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so if you go and do limited information, you'll see that it's very close to two standard squares. Now there is no forward and reverse limited information. But Fuller, you can run forward and reverse. Remember, I told you Fuller solved the problem. And you can see that Fuller is 0.093 and 0.096. And that pretty much does solve the problem. You know, you always get some stochastic variation. But these two are very close to each other. So that's, that's a good idea. <laughs> and of course, if you k equal 3, then forward or reverse Fuller are pretty close. But now let's do the following. Let's take a 1 in 1,000 random sample. Because the sample size of 3,293 is much more what you typically have in a you know, the sample size is more than 1,000, not than 100,000. Okay, well, least squares, you get pretty much the same effort as you should. Now when we do forward and reverse, things really go haywire. We get 0.098, and it goes up to 0.694. So you can see that the first order asymptotics now are going just horrible. If we only have k equal 3, then we do okay. But if we do k equal 30, and you usually want to use more instruments uh, because you get a more precise estimate. Because look, here the standard error is only 0.04. For the same sample size, if you only use three instruments, the standard error is four times as high or three times as high, three and a half times as high. So that's why you typically want to use all the instruments. Okay, well, what about the no-moment problem? Well, now we go over here and do limo. And uh, uh, if you do limo, you can see that the no moment problem has really come home to roost because we get a coefficient estimate of 0.855. This says for an extra year of education, your income just, your wage is just about double. Too big, doesn't pass what I call the smell test. So we know that, and if you look at the standard area, you can see it's gigantic. And so this is what's happened is two stage least squares hasn't done badly, but limo, because of the no moment problem, has gone completely haywire. And even though Fuller claims to have solved the problem, when you run four to reverse Fuller, you can see that the second order asymptotics are not working particularly well here because the second order Fuller you know, has solved the problem. But these two estimates should be the same. To start with 0.396, it's much too big to be believable. But when you run reverse Fuller, you get 0.831. So we have to know the minimal problem, even seeking in the second order. OK. so. I do some second order variance calculations. Again, I'm not going to take you through these. Um, and you can figure out what the optimal estimator is. This is just the reason I put these out in case you get interested. How do you do these second order expansions? Well, most of you, if you've had a course in probability of statistics, know the, how the central limit theorem works. You take the first order Taylor, stochastic Taylor expansion with a characteristic function when I get you the central limit theorem. And what we're basically doing now is taking the second order terms for that and in econometrics uh, and in certain parts of statistics that's called the Edgeworth expansion. And that's what we're essentially calculating here to compare the different estimators. So what we have to do in econometrics then is to see how things are working is to do Monte Carlo. So we come up with a design, we set that row equal to 0.5. And then we're going to look at the median bias, the root mean square error, and the inner quartile range. I'll just show you these quickly, but the conclusion is, is that you should use four uh, or two stage least squares. This is a jack knife estimator, right? I'm not going to talk about that today. However, you should not use a no moments estimator like Lowell or Nagar. And I'm going to show you why. So hopefully you can see these, but I'll just uh, point these out. So the R squared here is 0 0.01, which means you have weak instruments, or 0 0.1. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the sparks and look at the median bias. Now it turns out that little is median unbiased. So it should do the second order. So it should do quite well. And you can see up here, if we have 30 instruments, its median bias is 0.38. The so true coefficient here is 1. So you can see you get quite a lot of bias, even for a second order median on a biased estimator. The four estimator does just about as well. The guard does, you know, again in the ballpark. Uh, you can see that the two states we squares here does about as well, but up here it's more biased. Uh, and then these squares, of course, which you shouldn't use, the bias is always going to be equal to about a half. Now, if we, that's for 100 observations. If we go to 1,000 observations, you can see that the asymptotics kicks in pretty well. Limo is 0.04, so that's very close to zero. Uh, Nagar is 0.14, which is pretty good. But now you see 
see that two standard degree squares, the bias really doesn't go away. It's pretty much stays the same. It's 0 0.37, which is quite a bit of bias compared to little. So this is a kind of reason that a lot of people said, well, you, know, you should use little. But as I said, little has uh, no Lomas property. So if we go into root mean square error, and the root mean square error, remember, is a bias squared plus the gradient. You see that Lomo does really pretty horrible. It's 35.56 when you can get bigger numbers here. This is because, remember, the means of variance really don't exist. The fuller estimator, look how small it is. It has, the Lomo's do exist. So its asymptotic distribution actually is the second order. It's the same as Lomo. But the first order, you can just see that it does, or the second order, it does much better in the, in the Monte Carlo because it has moments. Now, it turns out that least squares though, does just as well. Even though least squares has bias, its variance is very small. It's a very efficient estimator. So it does well there. So you can see that you don't want to use little in this type of situation. <coughs> OK, so I told you I was wrong before when I told my students. And because I always thought that the problem with Limbo was just occasionally you get things way out of the tails. And of course, you know, some economics, you recognize when the tails are not using. But let's, let's consider the inner quartile range. The inner quartile range, remember, is the uh, amount of probability in between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. And you can see that Limbo actually does quite badly. It's 0.73. Fuller, this is the optimal fuller, it improves quite a bit. So, even if, in the cases where the no Loma problem, you know, which does create problems in the tails, the other problem with Loma, it has very heavy tails. You can see 1.09 and 1.61. And Fuller does quite a bit better. Okay. Uh, the GAR you don't want to use is very much like Loma. Two stage mean squares, though, for the inner quartile range does great because, uh, as I said, it has very low variance. So if you look at the root mean square error, uh, which doesn't exist for level, or you look at the inner quartile range, you can see you don't want to use that. And based on this, you'd essentially want to use the fuller estimator. Okay, so that's sort of the first half of the talk, and you might think, well, fine, uh, if I get interested in econometrics, I know what to do. But it turns out that uh, I haven't quite given you the whole story. Because if you go back to my original slide, Here, I'd assume, was called homoscedasticity. Homoscedasticity means that the variance is constant across all the observations. Now, the much more common thing in econometrics is to have heteroscedasticity, where the variance depends on the axis. Okay. And if you have heteroscedasticity, and you have many instruments, it turns out that Fuller is inconsistent. So that's the second part of the talk, and this is sort of new research. Okay, and so this is done jointly with a colleague of mine, Whitney Newey and Tina Wooderson, who's at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Okay, so we want to use many instruments if we have them, which we often do, because it improves the precision of the estimator. We talked about the bias in two squares, three squares. Limited information and fuller have lower bias, but they're not robust to heteroscedasticity of any In fact, they're inconsistent. So what we're going to do today is we're going <laughs> to always too many adjectives in uh, econometrics. We're going to give a heteroscedasticity robust jackknife version of Limo and Fuller. And we're going to rely on a new asymptotic sequence, which was started by a Japanese econometrician, Kudo Tomo, in the 1980s, but mainly developed by a Dutch econometrician, Becker, in an article in econometrics in 1994. So this is a situation where we're going to let the number of instruments go to infinity along with the sample size. But the ratio of the um, number of instruments to the sample size uh, remains finite. OK, so the model is going to differ a little bit. We're going to have y equal x del to 0 here. And we're going to allow for a nonlinear reduced form. Just uh, make this a little bit more general. But again, we have k instruments. Um, and um, OK. <laughs> OK, so the previous estimators, uh, we can set them all up as this. Uh, two stage least squares is just that projection matrix I had before, alpha 0. 
Limos, I said, gives you the smallest eigenvalue of what, at least when I was brought up, was called a quadratic pencil with Montmacher. I don't know what the term it goes by now. And then four, remember, takes C over N. I called it alpha in the other uh, first half of the lecture. And alpha, one over N, is um, the unbiased version, and C greater than or equal to four is the invisible version. Okay, well, two scientific squares is not consistent with many instruments. We saw that before because as k goes to infinity, uh, that numerator uh, doesn't go away in the bias term. And the way you can show that is what's called Fisher consistency after the most famous statistician in the first half of the 20th century, already Fisher. And if you work this out, Fisher consistency says that this what's called the normal equation in a convention. So statistics have to be equal to zero. Uh, but it's going to turn out not to be zero. Um, and that's what we show here. And so what we essentially do in the case of heteroscedasticity is we do this uh, uh, expansion, yet the remainder terms, little op, that stands for uh, order of probability of order one. And what you can show is that this term does not converge to zero under many instruments because PII does not go to zero. I sort of showed you that in, in the first part of the lecture. So this isn't consistent. <clears throat> okay, well, what about Limmel? Well, Limmel solves this equation here in this quadratic form, and uh, we get this term here. And so, again, we can say, well, what happens if sigma is not constant? If sigma varies with the observations, then we have sigma squared i. So you work this out, and you get this parameter gamma hat, uh, which is this term x prime u divided by u prime u. You can just see that x prime u divided by u prime u. And it's going to turn out that this term is what causes trouble for us because we get sigma i squared times gamma i squared divided by sigma i squared. Now, sigma i squared is constant. It could be pulled out of here, and you don't have a problem. But if it's not constant, uh, you get a problem. So again, we work through the conditions. And what we find is that Limmel is consistent if and only if gamma i <coughs> minus the average of gamma times pii times sigma i squared goes to zero, which will not, in general, hold. So the two ways it can be consistent are, first, the gamma i's can be constant. Uh, but that's, not, that's almost never going to hold. And the second is that, so long as you have kind of elasticity. And the second is that PII is constant. And this only happens in extremely uh, special cases. So in general, with many instruments in heteroscedasticity, we're going to get this term, PII, that's the uh, angular term of the projection matrix, sigma i, is going to be correlated with gamma i, so little will be consistent. OK, well, what do we want to do to get consistent estimates? <coughs> Well, the problem is, is that if we get that term PII in the double sum, and it turns out not to be zero. So uh, what you can do is to get rid of the PII term. So that's what we do here for two stage least squares. We get rid of the own terms. And people had looked at this before in, in two stage least squares. And so now we only have the cross terms, the PIJs from the projection. <coughs> and it turns out that that does give you are consistent estimators. And this is a jack -like estimator of Angus and Vincent Kruger. But it turns out, although uh, this uh, estimator is consistent under heteroscedasticity, it turns out that this <coughs> estimator doesn't have any moments. And in a paper by Davidson McKinnon, which got published in 2006, this does even worse than little under homoscedasticity because of the no moments problem. So what we're going to do is what's called a jack knife estimator. jack knife estimators were first figured out by an English statistician about 30 years ago. And uh, what you do is in a jack knife estimator is you remove the own observation. And you do this across all n observations. And for each one of those, you get the, the bias to n minus 1. And if you have the bias to n minus 1, and you know what the bias to n is, you can solve. Okay, so that's basically what you do. And so this estimator we call HRLI is a heteroscedastic robust version of Lummel, and it basically uses this jackknife <coughs> idea. 
And it turns out this is going to be consistent in NASA time to normal under many instruments, which is what we're worried about here, but also under weak instruments. And we estimate it's asymptotic variance under weak instruments. This is a slide from what we talked about today. And it solves this problem of jack IV, and it also solves the problem uh, of moments with Wimble. But even better, what we're going to do, I'll just show how to calculate it here, is we're going to use Fuller because Fuller does have moments, and Fuller with many instruments and hemispheticity is inconsistent. But if you do jackknife estimator here, with this horrible name, Henderson asking for bus fuller, uh, unbiased, you set the alpha equal to this. And it turns out that this does have moments. We proved it since the summer when I used this in London. And it does very well in the ocean. So as I told you before, the results of Hahn and Hausman show that the, the uh, Robust estimator can be interpreted as the optimal combination of forward and reverse jackknife IV. And we go through and show that here. So, this notion of simultaneous equations of looking at both the forward and reverse uh, models actually has a lot of power. In a regular least square statistical model, that would never make sense to do. But in econometric, since those variables y1 and y2 are simultaneously determined, it makes perfect sense to do. And we show that this estimate turned out to be the optimal or the combination of the forward and reverse estimate. Okay, so now we go through and we do the, the variance estimates. Uh, I'm not going to go through and show you that, but the general result is you get what's called a sandwich estimator. Um, this is a term used by statisticians of competition. So you get three terms, and the first term and the third term are the same. This is always the bread in the sandwich. And then you get this term in the middle, which is the hammer. But anyway, this, um, um, we show how to do that in the paper. Um, okay, then we generalize this to what's called generalized method of moments. Um, you can do this for nonlinear models as well as linear models. Uh, here, the G is a nonlinear model, but I don't really have time to talk about that today. So, what I'd like to do is just to finish up uh, with another Monte Carlo example that I'm just about out of time um, and show you what happens. Okay, so again we have a Monte Carlo model, the coefficient is equal to one, the unknown coefficient is equal to one, and we allow for heteroscedasticity in these terms here. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to show you the inner quartile range. Remember we talked about that before, and then I want to show you mean square error. So the inner quartile range, uh, these are the number of instruments, okay? So let's again focus on the number of instruments for reasons I don't want to go into. We have 28 instruments here rather than 30. It's just easier to do the line column for certain reasons. And you can see that the inner quartile range, limo again, this no moment problem, is really creating a problem because its inner quartile range is 10. Remember the true parameter is equal to 1. So that shows you both the no moments problem and the um, in, uh, inconsistency problem. <coughs> However, when we do this heteroscedasticity robust level, we see that we improve things quite a bit. It goes from 10 to 1.2. Uh, when we do the heteroscedasticity robust fuller estimator, it's about the same. It's 1.7 uh, and 1.7. And then if we compare that to the regular fuller estimator, without correcting for heteroscedasticity, you see the regular fuller estimator is 4, or either 2 or 4. So remember, I ended the last lecture by saying you should use fuller, but in the case of heteroscedasticity, fuller doesn't do well. And so what you need to do is to modify the estimator and use this h full estimator to take care, care of the problem. Similarly, you can see that by correcting for limo, you do quite a bit better. Okay, and then uh, similarly, if you go down here, where now uh, what we've done is to change, this is called the concentration parameter. So this means that the model fits a good deal better. You can see the limo doesn't do as badly. It goes from 10 to 2.3. But the heteroscedastic fix the limo still does a lot better. 
goes down by more than a factor of four. H polar does about the same. Uh, and you can see that regular polar does a lot worse. If we look at the mean square error, this is my handy handy research assistant always does this. This means that you can't fit the number of digits. This is an Excel. Uh, you can't fit the number of digits. So since we have two more digits, this means the mean square error for a limo is greater than 1,000. Okay, so again, the no moments problem has come back to haunt us. This is again why you shouldn't use limo. So here it was 10, now it's over 1,000 for the mean square error. And even the head of schedastic fix uh, to limo, it doesn't work because again, it just blows up. So if we compare that to the <coughs> fuller estimator, though you can see that the fuller estimator does a good deal better here. It's either 7 for this model, or for the higher concentration, rather, it's 1.1. Well, again, the model's not doing any good at all. And you can see that it does, here it actually is not doing better than the regular fuller model, but here it is. <laughs> so where this ends up is that um, I had a graduate student uh, many, many years ago, one of my first TAs, how white. And uh, if you take a econometric, you've heard of white standard errors. Those are the heteroscedastic robust standard errors. And what we find is that in most applications in econometrics, in what we call cross-section data, where we have these very large samples. So there are samples across either individuals or firms. Heteroscedasticity is almost always present. And so what this says is that if you're going to use, you know, here we're only using eight instruments. But, uh, if you have a lot of instruments and or you have weak instruments, you want to take this into account, and you really need to correct the heteroscedasticity. So just to finish up, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I've been lecturing on this subject for a very long time, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have said, you know, everybody uses two sets of squares, it works, yeah, we know that Limel's out there, but the first order, Limel doesn't do any better than two sets of these squares, and two sets of these squares is easier, so you should just do that. Well, then, in the late 90s, people came up with papers to show that two stage least squares could do pretty badly with weak instruments. There's a paper by Scott and Stagger and Conometric. Uh, and so they, they, their advice was to go to Limel, but it turns out that Limel doesn't work well. And so then, a couple years ago, five years ago, so I wrote a paper that said, well, you should use a fuller estimator. But now with heteroscedasticity, it turns out that none of the above work, and you really should use this modified fuller estimator to take account of heteroscedasticity. So I would say in the last 10 or 15 years, at least for simultaneous equations estimation in a continental, we've moved completely, pretty much completely off the first order approximations, which we had used for 50 years, give or take. And now pretty much all the uh, analysis, at least in this particular problem, are all second order uh, approximations. And so my last word here is, uh, although I've waved my hands a lot, some of these proofs actually are like 50 and 70 pages long. So I have two suggestions. One is to get a really smart co-author. And uh, <laughs> so I work with this guy, Jim Hahn, who used to be at Brown, is now at UCLA. And he's great at checking things. I can never do more than one page of proofs without making a mistake. I can convince myself I can prove anything because it's a question of getting it right. Uh, and the second thing you should do is to get a program like Mathematica uh, or Maple. And although they don't simplify that well, when you start doing your proofs and checking them there, it really helps a lot. I don't know whether they teach you that, you know, if you're applying that there. But in a 70-page proof, you can sort of follow through, and if you simplify using Mathematica or uh, maybe you save yourself a lot of embarrassment in the future. So I've really become a fan of those, because, you know, just writing out pages after pages for second order proofs when you have 20 or 30 terms in an expression, it's just much too easy to make mistakes. So you want to be very careful and get the right answer. I mean, oftentimes if you're good at this intuitively, you can figure out what the answer is, but proving it with all these terms, and you, know, you have terms of second order, third order, and fourth order, they just explode when you do this type of expansion. You want to be very careful. You have to use the way that I found to keep out these things. Okay, so I'll stop at that point and be glad to answer any questions.